Welcome to Skunk Works, where each episode we speak with CEOs of established SaaS companies about strategies for keeping innovation fresh. Hey everyone, my name is Eric. I'm the host of the Skunk Work podcast, where we trade innovation, sometimes war stories, with experienced business leaders such as Hat that I have the pleasure of welcoming on the show today. And before we begin, this episode is brought to you by Half Serious. It's a design and tech company that I founded where we work with leadership teams uh, who want to accelerate software as a service innovation projects. So Hat, thank you so much for being here. Super cool name, by the way. I love it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having me on, Eric. Uh, absolutely pleased to be on the Skunk Works podcast. Um, yeah, Hat's uh, an acronym of my name. It's something that stuck on from when I was really young. Uh, it's, I have a rather long name, Harish Anand Tilakan, long yeah. Indian name. And uh, I actually have a two-part first name. So people often get confused even with that. But uh, just growing up, my friends made it hat and it's just stuck. And uh, it's funny because my wife married me, took my last name, and now she's Matt. So, <laughs> we're, so we're Matt Hat dot I N is our Matt hat. website. Uh, yeah, there you so, go. That's very clever. Yeah, so, so, yeah, you share, so you share something sensitive about you. I'll share something sens- sensitive about me. My real last name is Eric Trashy Bourget, which is French, but in English, it's it's pronounced trashy. So I had to let it go because <laughs> there's just no way that I was going to carry that around. It's just way too, uh, way too difficult to explain. Sure, sure. All right. Sure. We're already off topic, but uh, we're going to have to catch this up. Okay. So one of the reasons I really wanted uh, to talk to you is that A lot of the really clever people that are running service businesses usually have a hand or a finger or two in a couple of product projects. Like That seems to be um, a pattern that I've noticed. I own a service company. I've launched a couple of product companies myself. And when we were talking before the show, as we were preparing for, for a couple of notes, there's a couple of reasons why I thought it was especially interesting. So... You work in a um, in an industry that's been hit pretty hard by COVID, right? So it's not only is it movies, but it's really movie like you're servicing movie theaters as a ser- uh, technology service company. And then when then all this hit, at some point, some part of your your Matt Hat uh, you know personality decided that you would double down and you would launch not only a single but Two products within the same industry, so sort of tripling down on this bet that you had on on this. So, I think the first part of this conversation should absolutely be you explaining your business and then explaining that that decision. Sure. Uh, I started off uh, seventeen years ago now, and we were like any other technology company overseas. Uh, but we started back in India when I was sixteen, and uh, and wait. The numbers in that, I'm not 33, I wish I was. But <laughs> I did start when I was 16, took a break, then resumed when I was 21. But uh, we were like any other company building websites because that's all there was back then, right? That's all consumer technology was back then was websites. And um, somehow we got sucked into what I call the vortex of movie theaters. And, and you know, we were building solutions for them. Online ticketing was beginning to pick up uh, way before it made it across the shores here to the U.S., we had online ticketing, online food and beverage. We actually first sold popcorn on a movie theater's website in India in 2007. Wow. And, and, and yeah, people on state side only saw it like maybe four years ago or three years ago. So, so that's where we started from. And of course, along the way, we worked with all industries, all domains, multiple you know, sectors. But cinema, I guess, became our calling. We were really, really proud of the work we did for them. Uh, we were inclined as a team to innovate for the industry. I still believe that the problem is not with movie going, because I think people still enjoy going to the movies. Uh, but there is resistance and competition. You know, within the industry, we hear a lot of people telling us that, listen, this is what they said when VHS came out. This is what they said when DVDs came out. So what they right. said when Blu-ray came out. Guess what? Cinemas are still here. Truth be said, that hubris can definitely land this industry to trouble because unlike all of those options, streaming is at such a low cost, at such a high convenience that it's it's a veritable, genuine alternative to consuming entertainment, right? right. And, 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 and unless movie makers and exhibitors, and we call them exhibitors, 
you know, unless they come together and look at solving this problem uh, together, not just from a business model perspective, but also in terms of embracing technology and data, it's going to be a very, 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 very hard, hard journey, you know, to stay relevant. But it's good that we get most exhibitors acknowledge that they 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 identified and they are choosing to embrace technology solutions that are put forth by companies like mine. Um, at Influx, we build we we are a we are a, we are a software company, but we like working in the guest facing space. Anything that works with an end user, but on behalf of a company. So I guess you can say we're B to B to C. Right. Um, but we're across domains. We're across platforms. And we like to work within specific niches. Uh, I think Mark Cuban very, very, uh, you know, famously once said, you got to operate and own the niche that you're able to find, however small that niche may be. And, and I think that's why we managed to find our niche in, in, in movie theaters. But I know you said that we kind of doubled down or tripled down during the pandemic and innovated for the cinema industry, which we did. And I'll talk about that in a second. But I think what it also taught us was that what we've done really well or the expertise that we have isn't just in movie theaters. You've got to be able to look at homogenous industries or homogenous use cases where the same knowledge or solutions can be applied. So you're looking and for patterns. What, correct, right? Patterns where we can extend or extrapolate what we've already built. And in doing so, we found some very, very crowded marketplaces that still had the gaps, that still had the niches that we could exploit. And uh, we're super excited to have you know, actually found such a niche in the restaurant industry. We've been proud to find such a niche in the hotel space. And, and that's helped us sort of grow our tentacles without having to sacrifice our, our core focus, which is cinemas. You know? so, right. so I just want to repeat that to make sure that I, that I understood. Sometimes the best way to make sure that I get something is, let's see if I could repeat it. So what you're saying is you've, you've, you've solved a problem in a niche, niche, and then you're, you're looking at other verticals, such as restaurants and stuff like that, and you're saying, hey, this pattern here of, of problems exists in these other niches, or I think people would call them other verticals. And then you're, you've decided to expand beyond your your initial uh, niche but then don't you find that the problem then becomes marketing because you have a very simple and compelling story when you're just looking at the movie industries or 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 the exhibitors and then when you start going to the like as a product person you understand that this product can can do all these things but then as you're going from vertical to, to vertical it becomes a communication issue doesn't it it does if you're going in mass if i were to go take a QR code scanning ordering system, which I have for cinemas, which was absolutely path breaking during the pandemic because mm -hmm. the tradition, you know, your audience was probably used to a lot of SaaS products and used to being out there and using technology. Maybe like, wait, hold on. Why is it so revolutionary to scan a QR code to place an order? The reason why it's so revolutionary in the movie theater industry is because the core software that runs movie theaters mm -hmm. is not natively geared towards that. Got it. The restaurant that you go to down the street is probably running a point of sale like Toast, which is geared towards that, right? Or is probably using uh, another tool like Clover, which is geared towards that. Or even now the legacy ones like Aloha are geared towards that because the market, A, wants it. B, their customer base is so large that it makes sense for them to throw development dollars behind building these solutions for that industry. Whereas the movie theater industry Let's admit it, it's a very small business, right? I mean, the US box office was $11 billion in 2019. The entire global industry is about, is about $33, $35 billion. And that, that's pretty small compared to like the gazillion dollars that, that you know, uh, restaurants are. So therefore, given how legacy the core software platform is, introducing something like that is not as easy. In fact, our product that we launched last year was called Intake, which is a contactless online ordering solution for food and beverage. To get it to resemble a Postmates or a Uber Eats or a Grubhub kind of an interface, I can tell you, A, how hard it was, and B, how nobody else has done it, and mm -hmm. C, how nobody else has managed to do it ever since. We so have so what, what, what does it do, just so I, I understand? I'm sitting down, ready for my for the movie to start, and I, I can order a drink or, or, or food? 
from my seat so or a, so a is you can order your food and drink when you're buying your ticket which is advance ordering okay b is you're in the lobby you can order your food and beverage there or c if you're in your seat you can scan the qr code and it knows exactly which seat you're sitting in it knows which auditorium you're sitting in therefore they know where to bring the food ah and where it gets even more, even smarter is in the delivered seat options because nowadays you know you have the more luxurious movie theaters where you can order to your seat and they have these nice fold out tables you have a recliner where you're sitting back you get really cool service and 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 here's an interesting tidbit ever since the movies kind of came back with king kong last year you'd be surprised but most people are going to the movies for the luxury experience yeah i mean yeah, i'm not, not surpri- i'm not surprised at all that's what i'm going through as well when i went to see dune i'm like there's no way i'm waiting for that thing to come out on my my small tv i'm going to see that i'm getting the imax experience for sure but i went to the more expensive movie theater where i could sit down and i could enjoy a meal and order from from my seat i mean that's the now it's like the restaurant industry and the the movie industry are kind of coming together and so i i understand even more where you're coming from in terms of be able to to reconcile both of these things but i could geek out on business models all day long what i really want to know is um at some point you're a service company meaning that movie theaters or big blocks chains are probably coming to you because they're looking for a custom solution and was there a moment where you're like hey i could offer this to all movie theaters and how do you how did you go from you know building a custom product for someone to building your own thing that you could then license out to 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 ever was there like a did you buy back the license like what was the deal there what was the uh, the impetus so i think uh, it's, it's it's exactly like you said right we were once we knew we were in the niche i guess between 2006 and 2010 we had worked with every movie theater chain in india in 20 10/11 we went westwards towards the middle east and we signed on with dubai's number one movie theater chain and thereafter we started signing on a lot of movie theaters now it was a bit of a catch 22 because we were a service company but the reason we were getting business and winning business was because they realized we had an expertise and therefore they expected a quicker go to market Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, if we were rebuilding every single project by as a project, we were not going to market quickly. And therefore, there came a point where we were like, for our own sake of profitability, of being able to turn on the project quicker and to gain the key advantage of being the fastest go to market, it just makes sense for us makes sense for us to productize certain parts of the solution, right? And that's when we. started building our first product which is engine which is a middleware layer that can sit on top of any cinema's software whatever software they use or whatever combination of software that they may use and it kind of creates this homogenous layers of apis that any front end can then consume whether you're an app your website your kiosk uh, we power literally anything that has a screen and it runs off this middleware layer the same middleware layer was then spawned off to be able to create templated websites because as i wanted to enter the us market i realized that the us has a really long really long long tail of 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 movie theaters like you have the amc's up here mm-hmm. you have the cinema and the regals here you have a big belly but then the long tail is really long of what we call the onesies and twosies those guys are not going to pay the same kind of money that the top 10 pay right? right so for them we had to be able to come up with like a out of the box templated solution where one of our recent investor calls they actually called us uh the shopify for cinema websites right uh, i love that go, i'm betting that you love that you love oh, being yeah. called at, the shopify yeah. of cinema for so sure so you go and you you pick you, you essentially no actually our investor was not happy about that they were like you can literally become the shopify of any enterprise grade business website because yeah. end of the day banks use apis uh fintech uses apis retail uses apis all of them use apis based systems and for somebody running a reasonably enterprise grade business you can't go use shopify but our solution can actually work so mm. therefore that's what bred engine that's what led us to build engine as our first product and um like i told you before it's a super slippery slope man i mean it's very easy to get it wrong and i think the path of services to product companies is littered with body bags and 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 it's very hard to not become one of those because 
That was yeah, that was a very graphic metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> especially, say, yeah. especially in the case of companies like ours, where we're not venture funded, yeah. we have been bootstrapped all along, even till till, till today. We're, we're oh, wait, did, did you just talk about an investor a few minutes ago? Looking to raise oh, potential okay. investor. Yeah, Got looking it. to raise. So you know, so you know, while we are uh, while we're essentially trying to plow back our profits mm-hmm. to to build these products, it can go horribly wrong. Yeah. Because in trying to, you know, plan for the dream, you can burn down the house today. Yeah. And it's 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 a very real risk, like you probably know. I mean, you do the same thing, right? So which is why I don't think we've been able to do full justice, I'd say, to our product portfolio. Because the other that's the other problem, right? With 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 service industry founders is you get the first product out and then you get excited. Because then you realize this is your ticket to valuation. Mm-hmm. Because services companies have ship valuation. I'm sorry, my language, but <laughs> the, the services companies have. You have, said have, ship, right? Like a like a ship, ship. like yeah, shipping. Okay. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, so, so services companies have really poor valuations, right? Yeah. Uh, it's the SaaS company and the product companies that have all the cool valuation, and then of course. as a services company founder, you 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 have your first product. You then start seeing the ability for you to be able to clone and replicate, and start seeing some you know check in the mail money. And then you're going, wait, I want to do my second thing. I want to do my third thing. And then you realize you haven't done any of them right. right. And, and, and even we're guilty of that, to be honest. Um, but it's just the nature of the beast, unless I think you have the kind of bank to be able to fuel that kind of ambition. Uh, it's easy to get it wrong. But yeah. luckily, we have not. Because yeah, that, Sorry, no, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was saying very early on, uh, I, 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 was, I was told and I, I acknowledged this and I kind of reflected and I realized that as a services company, if you want to become a product company, there's only one way to do it, and which is your enterprise customers. You're going to have to find a customer who buys into your vision, pays for it because they need it, and you somehow still retain the right to be able to replicate that as a product and get it out to market. Mm. There is no other way, unless you're funded, unless you have cash cushions, there is no other way for you to build it. So. It worked in our favor because we were working in such a tight, small industry. Because we have to come up with unique solutions for each one of them to be able to stand out yet compete in the same markets, we were able to identify solutions for each exhibitor and position them as individual products. Okay. I, I'm processing that. So uh, the um, I spoke to a seasoned entrepreneur not too long ago whose name is uh, Dick Hyatt. He runs a company called Decisive, and he was talking to me about anchor clients and i think it's a similar concept right you you basically get this one big client that's going to dominate you in the early years but they're happy to see you because you're providing with a faster part path to market because you've got something that's you're sort of built you're taking on the risks probably like you're you're offering it to him like a a license when in fact your your burn is higher than than that license can possibly be but at least you have got a foot in the market you've got credibility you've got bragging rights you're able to go back to the rest of the market and say hey you see this this giant here they're using us and then you're sort of building that that reputation to to cross the uh to cross the chasm what i'm uh, what I don't understand, as someone in my position, is that I've I've started um, product companies in the past where I've always faltered is when I tried to be the CEO of both of these companies, right? So it's like it, they're two different brains. They're two different types of um, of decision making and and lens through which you're looking at the world, right? So if I'm running my my service company, I know that if I I put you know five developers on a project. I'm I'm making margins right away, right? Of course, my valuation is ship, like you just said, but uh, but I'm prof- profitable right away. It's very low risk, especially in this very difficult talent environment. If I've got the talent, I'm gonna I'm gonna get the revenues. That's for sure. Um, but if I start investing in product, now marketing becomes very important. Now raising money becomes like a key priority and all this stuff. And, and they're very difficult rhythms and, and types of, of, uh, of, of ways of looking at things. So how do you, you know, without going completely crazy and doing, going like split personality, how do you split your focus? I could even understand two product companies, but a service company and a product company, I'm having a really hard time figuring out how you're staying focused. Like I, I would love for you to share a trick that sounds like 
on Monday and Tuesdays, I work on the service company. And then I like, how do you, how do you split these things to not go crazy? So I don't think I've mastered it. Neither do I think I've done a fantastic job of it. But I'll tell you what I think we did right that stopped us from burning the house down. Instead of trying to package our entire solution or offering as a product, we only picked a core piece of it that we made into a product, which is essentially the API and the middleware and the and sort of the content management piece. That's what we productized, but we wrapped the whole thing with our services layer. So therefore, I'm not having to work on one or the other mm-hmm. because as I'm trying to, so we have three kinds of clients. One, somebody who wants a bespoke project doesn't care about the, you know, the, the middleware or any of the products that we have. They want a pure services project. The second is somebody who wants a pure out-of-the-box solution, which is the Shopify website, right? The Shopify website for cinemas, where you go in, you pick a theme, you say, okay, this is my version of my software. This is, I want to sell f and I don't want to have tipping. I want to enable modifiers, yada, yada, yada. And you come out of that out-of-the-box solution, which is pure product. Right. Say. And then you have the hybrid, which is somebody says, I want all the flexibility of the middleware and the controls and being able to manage everything myself, but I want a bespoke front end. Mm-hmm. Right. So hybrid. So, correct. So, so instead of trying to make the whole thing a product, we chose to pick out that most replicated, most frequently done, that most annoying part of development and made that into the product while keeping all the fun, soft, you know, uh, the, the fun part of it as still a service. I got it. And, and, I like and, it. and, and also, I guess the, the, the bigger question that keeps coming up is when you come up with a feature idea, the moment you, again, I come up with a feature idea, I've got to sell it to a client first because they got to fund it. Now, once they f- choose to fund it, they want it quickly. But then the moment I go across this wall to my products, she goes, I got to put on my feature backlog. Yeah. And I'm like, yo. Is it on, on the roadmap? I just, yeah. I just sold it to someone. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean it's going to go into the feature backlog? And she's like, yeah, I've got all of these other features I got to put out. So I guess that becomes a tricky part. You know, how do you decide when a feature is a feature of a product versus when do you just do it as a deliverable to a project? Those can get tricky. Uh, because that's, that's the, so I, I, I always try to, to figure out what the poster is. Like what's the, your face, your name, and then the quote below that. And I think that, uh, no, not, I'm not talking about oh. a poster behind you. I'm oh. just saying that a poster that I would write with something that you just said. And I think that what you just said is the best way to not split your brain in half is to actually not split your, your actions so much, right? Because yeah. now instead of saying, well, when, when we're acting like a pure play service company, we look like the bespoke thing that you said. When we act like a product company, we um we you know we run we sell the out of the box stuff and then there's this piece in the middle and what you're doing as you're going from client to client is sort of playing on that um absolutely playing on that line which means yeah. that it probably feels to you like you're you're managing a single company but you're um uh you're sort of adapting the strategy to the client and their their needs and and probably their means I'm guessing. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to see if I can show you. Can I share screen? Let's yeah, sure, of course. Okay. We're gonna have to describe it for people that are just uh, they're just gonna get this over audio. Right. So what I'm trying to put up here, and I'm gonna have to hide my client names, I guess. Um, okay. So what I'm gonna show you guys is how we typically onboard clients. So right up top, you see we have two hemispheres. We have the cinema hemisphere up mm-hmm. here, and we have the non-cinema hemisphere up here. All right, so I'm just going to describe is, this for people that, are, that don't have video. Uh, I'm looking so, at so a, I have Google, a table. Oh, yeah. So I have a table where on the x-axis, I've got all my products and services of the company. Mm-hmm. And on the y-axis, I have a list of all my clients. And I've hidden my client names. Yep. Right? So that's on the y-axis. So what you're seeing here is how I make an inroad into a client. So let's park my non-cinema clients for a second because I have no product to offer them as yet, as of mm-hmm. 2021. 
Yeah. But as of 2021, I do have products to offer my cinema clients. So the X-axis products are essentially, I have three products. Engine, which is my middleware that I was talking about, mm-hmm. which is the Shopify of, you know, the Shopify of cinemas. You then have Intake, which is the contactless food and beverage ordering service that I was talking about. Uh-huh. And then you have Infinity, which is our subscription module. If you guys remember Movie Pass, we're trying to help Movie Pass make a comeback, but on behalf of the cinemas, not as a third party service, because there are cinemas who are looking to offer their own subscription service now. Mm-hmm. So, so, with those products in the X axis, Engine itself, I break down into three, which is three I just spoke to you about. First, non engine is where they are out completely out of the product framework. They're just bespoke. a pure project, pure bespoke project. Then within engine, you have the core product is engine, but then they have a bespoke front end. And then the third is the out-of-the-box solution, right? And I have this matrix color-coded, and I have numbers one, two, three, four, five, six that you know whoever's on video can see. That shows you how I enter a particular client. So for somebody who is a smaller company with a smaller budget, here, let me zoom in lest Eric loses his eyesight. So for somebody who has- <laughs> We're, we're going to invite everyone on iTunes and Spotify to just go to YouTube and find this, uh, <laughs> this video. It's worth it. Okay. So this shows you how for smaller clients, we enter first with a templated solution. So that's why you see the ones here. Mm-hmm. Right. Whereas for the larger ones, you'll find that we enter either with a bespoke or a hybrid solution. And then we use our products or our services as a way in to then be able to upsell everything else that we have. So very few line items would you see where I don't have at least 50% of my rose color code. Amazing. I love it. I will copy the shit out of this strategy. <laughs> I promise Shipping you that the ship out of this strategy for sure, because I definitely like lights are going on in my, in my brain now, because a lot of the companies that I deal with are, are, are companies that have a long legacy, uh, you know, of older technology and they're looking at AWS and all the cool stuff that's happening there and are trying to bridge that gap. But then once they bridged it, they want to build cool new stuff. So if I was able to build something that helps the transition from legacy to this, like the that path, because that's the that's the thing that no one really wants to pay for. That's not sexy. That's like redoing the bricks on your house versus remodeling your kitchen, right? Yeah. You don't care about the bricks. They're gonna look the same after. It's just they're not gonna be broken anymore. You don't you don't wanna pay for that. You just wanna and so I think that that could be Or the plumbing, right? Or the plumbing, yeah, all that unsexy. The plumbing, I had the plumbing. You know what? I'm again, we'll steal something from what you just said. I think the plumbing makes a lot more sense. Like, <laughs> like don't pay, like pay the minimum for the plumbing or license that out or or, or something. Okay. I love it. I I went over my time just because I got um, overly excited. Uh, Hat, this is not what I expected, but this is exactly what I think I needed. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for all that wisdom. And uh, and like I said to the people that are listening to this over over audio only, please go and and try to find the the episode with hat so that you could see his Excel spreadsheet. It's simple, but it's genius at the same time. So it's the uh, stuff that you're looking for. All right, hat. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate pleasure, your time man. and generosity. All right, sure. thank you for what you're doing for keeping the community together. I mean, I'm sure you know when these days at least we're still able to meet each other a lot more. But then when times were not as conducive to meeting in public. I'm sure this sort of really helped. So thank you for doing it. All right. Have a good one. Take care. Thanks for listening to Skunk Works. We'll see you again next time. And be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.